Hello everyone, thank you for joining today's overview of the 2021 Quality Payment Program Final Rule Webinar. During today's webinar, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will provide an overview of the final rule of the 2021 performance period of the Quality Payment Program. After the webinar, CMS will take as many questions as time allows. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Michelle Schreiber, who is the Deputy Director of Quality and Value in the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality and Director of the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group within the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality at CMS to begin. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you very much. That was a mouthful to say, wasn't it? Welcome to all of you to the 2021 QPP Final Rule Webinar. We're very excited that you're on the line with us today. At CMS and really across the entire government, ensuring that patients are getting the care they need during COVID has been our most important priority. We listened to your feedback over this time and we have limited the number of significant changes to the quality payment program in 2021 so that we were reducing role writing and trying to reduce any burden that we could. As you know, across CMS, we have also offered multiple waivers and uh, tried to make our response help providers care for patients as much as possible and keep our patients safe. I do want to note a thank you to all providers who are on the phone and all of you who are working with COVID patients. You are truly the heroes uh, in, uh, in care today. So from all of us to all of you, a sincere thank you. In this most recent final rule that was just released, we focused our policies around the highest priorities for the program with the intent that they're less burdensome. And there are several key areas that we'll be discussing today. The first is our transition to value through the MIPS value pathways. We've done a tremendous amount of stakeholder engagement and we finalized the update for the MIPS transition to MIPS value-based pathways. And we outlined a process in which stakeholders can follow to submit a MIPS value pathway candidate. I'm very encouraged by the multiple conversations we have had with specialty societies in the development of MVPs. Stakeholders are encouraged to use the MVP submission template to submit candidates for CMS consideration. And this is available in the QPP um, resource library. We did not introduce formally any MVPs this year because we, uh, again, wanted to wait until um, we had less, uh, less chaos perhaps going on, but we wanted to wait to give organizations plenty of time to help us with development. But we did establish the process for doing so. Any MVPs that are developed will be submitted through rule writing. The second note is that we finalized the APM performance pathway for participants in MIPS APMs, which is composed of a fixed set of measures for each MIPS performance category. Since the APP is required for ACOs in Medicare Shared Savings Program, we will be talking about that in greater detail later. For MIPS, we continue to work towards the performance category weights required by statute for the 2022 performance year. So you will see some changes in the performance weights, including around cost and quality. Additionally, we made updates around the CMS web interface as a collection and submission type for 2021 performance, as well as an update to some measures, and we'll be updating those as we walk through each performance category's policy change. Finally, I want to remind everyone that for um, the emergency circumstances policy, because of the ongoing COVID pandemic, we have extended the deadline to submit an extreme and uncontrollable circumstance exception application. This would allow reweighting of one or more, including all, of your MIPS performance categories. The deadline for submission is now February 1st. We'll go into the details of the QPP final rule, um, and we have many of our uh, subject matter experts from CMS on the phone. Again, I would like to thank all of you for your participation today, all of you for the care of patients in uh, this crisis situation, and I'd also like to thank the CMS staff, not only for their expertise in uh, getting the QPP rule 
for uh, but for all the work that they have done for COVID as well. So I turn it over to Katie Moore to continue, and thank you for attending today. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Sharver, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out um, to be with us today. I know this, this rule has been a, a, a while coming. We had a, a little bit of delay getting it out this year because of everything else that's been going on. Um, so really appreciate your patience and um, look forward to our discussions here today. And I'd just like to echo Michelle's comments about um, just thank you so much for all that you all are doing. I know on this call we have a lot of our, our frontline clinicians and staff that are really working hard across this country to address the pandemic. And uh, we're here to support you, and we uh, want to be able to answer all the questions we can uh, related to this final rule. So just thank you for everything you're doing day to day, and um, really appreciate it. All right, we're going to go through these first few slides real quick so that we can get to our, our policies and then um, have as much time at the end for discussion. So uh, the slide you're seeing right here, Michelle touched on this. We um, have extended our extreme and uncontrollable circumstances uh, exception application for 2020. Again, we know everybody has way more bigger um, Sorry, I think I lost your protect. There we go. Um, we have a lot more uh, important things going on right now across the country um, trying to address the pandemic. So we wanted to be able to offer this flexibility and give folks that are really impacted um, by the pandemic to have additional time to submit an application. Um, so just as a reminder, this policy allows MIPS eligible clinicians groups, virtual groups, and now with uh, a change in this final rule that we're talking about today, APM entities to submit an application requesting reweighting of your MIPS performance categories to 0% due to uh, the current COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, so the current deadline is now extended to February 1st, 2020. Um, we did uh, want to make sure just uh, everybody is aware this is a um, that even though we're extending the application deadline, if you do submit uh, 2020 data during our submission period, which opens on January 4th, uh, 2021. Um, so any individuals, groups, and virtual groups that uh, submit data during that period, your data will override, that data submission will override any application that was submitted um, before, before the data submission period or um, before this deadline or after, after the data submission period opens but before the deadline ends. Data submission will override uh, that application. The only cave caveat here to mention is that for APM entities, um, data submission will not override performance category reweighting. So just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. So please, um, if you need to submit an application, it is open now, and you have until February 1st to get that into us. And one more note here at the bottom, the deadline for the separate promoting interoperability hard hardship exception application, uh, that deadline is remaining at December 31st, but that is separate from the extreme and uncontrollable circumstances application. And we do have um, a number, a couple of new resources that will help people with this application. We have a video posted to our resource library as well as a step-by-step how-to guide um, with screenshots that will show you everything you need to know about the application and how to set up different accounts to access it. Next slide, please. Oh, can we move ahead to the next slide, please? And I'm going to keep talking in case it's my screen that is, oh, there we go. Um, so here's just really quick, here is our rundown agenda for what we're going to be discussing today. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, we're talking about the 2021 uh, final rule. So we're going to keep um, all the discussion here today really focused on, on that topic. So we are going to go through a couple of really high-level QPP overview slides. Then we'll transition into our Merit-Based Incentive Payment System MIPS overview. 
um, and go through some really specific um, information on the MIPS policies and then really highlight our MIPS value pathways. Um, and we'll get into more. We have a, a more in-depth uh, webinar scheduled for next Monday that we'll talk about briefly that goes into a lot more, um, more of the details that were in this final rule specific to MVP. Uh, we will also touch on our APM performance pathway that's new uh, with this rule, our APP. And then we will talk through some advanced APM updates as well as some uh, Medicare Shared Savings Program updates. And then we will get into the most important part today is really our Q&A where we get to hear from you and um, look forward to that discussion. Next slide, please. And one more. Okay, so folks on this call, a lot of you have probably seen this slide um, in all of our materials and information a number of times, but for anybody who's new um, to the Quality Payment Program, uh, the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015, which we refer to as MACRA, uh, requires CMS to implement an incentive program, which is the Quality Payment Program. And there are two participation tracks in this program. So there is uh, MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. So if you're a MIPS-eligible clinician, uh, which um, we go into a lot more detail on, on what our definition of a MIPS-eligible clinician is, uh, you will be subject to a performance-based payment adjustment um, through this part of the program. Um, there is also advanced APM track of the program. So if you participate in an advanced APM and achieve QP status, you may be eligible for a 5% uh, incentive payment and you'll be excluded from uh, participation through MIPS. Next slide, please. And I'll just touch on these uh, very briefly. These are really our um, are really our guiding uh, policy or strategic objectives that we really try and um, focus on as we're implementing this program and as we continue to improve the program. Uh, top priority is always keeping the patient at the center of all that we do. So improving patient population health, improving beneficiary care. Uh, we want to lower costs through care and health improvement. Uh, while advancing the use of health information between providers and patients so that we can really um, use data to empower patients uh, to make the best decisions they can about their care. Maximize QPP participation with design and easy-to-use tools. So everything you'll see on our website, um, all of our, our lookup tools and different things that we've developed to, make, um, to help clinicians participate successfully in this program. Uh, we maximize our QPP participation, education, outreach, and support. Um, and then while working towards expanding alternative payment model participation, uh, we want to provide actionable performance data. All the feedback that you receive, we want you to be able to, um, to know how to use it, what you can do with it. And we are continuously improving uh, QPP. So always looking for suggestions on what we can do next to improve our policy or um, improve how you um, participate in the program. Next slide, please. And I believe, yes, I am going to hand it over to Brittany Locator to talk uh, about our APM. And Brittany, if you're talking, we can't hear you. I think if Brittany, um, we might need to troubleshoot with her. She's she's on um, via her computer, just not the phone. Um, is someone able to help um, with her initial slides while we figure that out? Oh, sure. Hey, everybody. This is Katie Moore. I'll just keep going until Brittany's able to hop back on. Okay, so this is a new slide for QPP. So this is um, just really trying to give a visual representation of alternative payment models and the different types of APMs. Um, so APMs overall reward healthcare providers for delivering value-based care. Um, so they can apply to specific either health conditions. Um, as we have here, we have an example of end-stage renal disease. 
they either focus on care episodes like joint replacement, um, or they focus on a specific population like primary uh, care providers in, in Maryland. Um, so as you'll see in this diagram, there are different types of ATMs. So you have your alternative payment models, and then within that, you have um, models that are included in MIPS, so our MIPS ATMs. And then as we discussed on the previous slide briefly, um, for those APMs that achieve uh, qualifying participant status, so QP status, they are, um, they are also on our advanced APMs. So the designation of APM does not affect a clinician's eligibility for MIPS. APM participants will still need to participate in MIPS unless they receive that QP status or are otherwise exempt. All right, let's move to the next slide. So again, here's just another visual um, representation of, of all the different um, uh, types of ATMs. So qualifying ATM participants or QPs are eligible clinicians who have met or exceeded the payment amount or patient count threshold based on participation in an advanced APM. So they are exempt from reporting in MIPS and they earn a 5% uh, payment on Part B claims. So partial QPs can choose whether or not to participate in MIPS. All right, next slide. And we'll, we'll figure out how to get Brittany back on the line and I'm sure she will be able to um, you know, a lot more details than I was able to, so um, bear with us as we work through that. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I believe I am handing this over to Molly McCarris. Okay, thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone, for joining us here today. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so similar to the slides you guys have seen already today, hopefully this is not new information for you all. Um, again, when we think about the MIPS program, what we do under MIPS is we assess clinicians' performance on four separate performance categories, including quality, cost, improvement activities, and promoting interoperability, which deals with the usage of certified EHR technology. We assess clinicians' performance on those four um, categories and what we look to do is to see how their combined performance, which we call a final score, how that relates to a previously finalized performance threshold. So for the 2021 year, the performance threshold is finalized at 60 points. So we would ideally look to see clinicians' final scores at or above that to avoid our negative payment adjustment. We'll be talking through this in more detail later on as well. Also, I wanted to note that while we revised the weights for quality and cost this year, next year, calendar year 2022, by law, both quality and cost must be at 30 points. So I wanted to flag that for folks' awareness uh, now so they can start tracking to that if you're not already doing so. Okay, let's move on to the next slide where there's just a few refreshers on some of our key terms. So again, hopefully this is not new information to you all, but if it is, uh, this is important because we define a MIPS eligible clinician based off of their unique TIN and PI combination. So again, the TIN is the text identification number, the NPI is the national provider identifier, and that unique combination is how we look to determine whether or not someone is eligible from the MIPS program or if they would be otherwise excluded. Um, so it is possible that if you are a clinician that practices uh, medicine at multiple organizations, that you could have multiple 10 MPIs. Uh, we encourage you to come to our website, qpp.cms.gov, where you can go to our lookup tool by entering your NPI, and we will provide back to you the available information we have on file. Uh, I also wanted to flag within this slide that we have now come to our maximum amount of payment adjustments that we can distribute, which is up to 9% subject to a scaling factor to maintain budget neutrality. 
Let's move on to the next slide with uh, just our high-level timeline. And as you can see on the slide here, calendar year 21 will be our performance year. The majority of data submission will follow the calendar quarter after that. We would then issue feedback and then issue our payment adjustments in calendar year 23 for 2021 performance. Let's move on to the next slide, please. And then the next slide again. Okay, so starting with our MIPS value pathway. So as I'm sure folks heard in Dr. Schreiber's opening remarks, uh, we are very excited about our new MIPS value pathways or MVP approach mm -hmm. to the program. Um, I do, again, want to iterate that we are not introducing any MVPs into the program for the 2021 performance period. Um, again, due to the pandemic, which has impacted all of us, we wanted to take some additional time to really ensure that we can uh, take into account all of your feedback, all of our stakeholders' feedback, as we work to develop this new approach. We do anticipate that MVPs will be an available reporting option, however, beginning in 2022. We did, though, make a couple of updates to the MVPs uh, in this year's rule, including making updates to our guiding principles, and we also finalized a set of criteria that we will use when creating the MVP candidates. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide where I, we have this information available. Um, I'll flag in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail today, but I do want to alert folks that we are having a separate webinar on Monday, uh, December 14th, to go over all of the MVPs, the guiding principles, and our detailed criteria and how organizations would actually have to submit to their candidate MVP. Uh, we will be going over all of that on Monday. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't go over this in too much detail, but I do want to note that the updates to our guiding principles, those updates are in italics, and that includes the incorporation of the patient voice, as well as uh, putting a further emphasis not only on outcome measures, but digital quality measures. Let's move on to the next slide. And so for our finalized MVP development criteria, um, so again, I won't be going over this in too much detail, but let me just pause right here so folks can take a look at what our criteria consists of. Um, and then let's move on to the next slide. Our additional development criteria, this is uh, some of the specifics related to the quality performance category as well as cost and how those are linked. Let's move on to the next slide. And then uh, this slide here deals with the improvement activities and how those should be linked, uh, the usage of the entire set of the promoting interoperability measures and our hospital-wide readmission measures. Let's move on to the next slide. And then, uh, as I mentioned at the onset here, we are having our uh, MVP candidate development webinar on Monday, December 14th. Registration is still open for that, so highly encourage everyone to please register for that. Um, and again, that's where we will be going over all of this criteria in more detail, as well as specific details on how to complete the uh, candidate submission template. Let's move on to the next slide. And the last item I wanted to touch on is our upcoming town hall. Uh, so hopefully folks saw our Federal Register notice as well as um, our listers that we've issued on this. We, um, since as both myself and Dr. Schreiber um, mentioned already today, uh, of course the pandemic has impacted all of our lives and as uh, we noted, this has caused us to uh, have a slight delay in our implementation of MVPs. Since uh, a lot of what we wanted to talk to you all about, we were not able to do so since, uh, again, the pandemic, um, what we have done is we are having a town hall on January 7th where we have a number of items that we really would love to get stakeholder feedback on, including subgroups, MVP design, as well as MVP reporting requirements, choice, and scoring. Um, the event is currently full. It's uh, been very popular. So if you were not able to register and if you would like to attend, 
please reach out to us at our email address, cmsmvpfeedback at ketchum.com to be added to the wait list. We are looking to uh, see what we can do to free up more spots. And to the extent that we can, if you are on the wait list, you will automatically be added to the webinar. Um, the last thing I want to note is in the event you are not able to uh, be added to the webinar, we will still be accepting written feedback up until January 14th. And again, more details about the uh, town hall itself are available on our website. So from here, let me turn the presentation over to Brittany, who I believe uh, we can hear now. So Brittany, let me turn it to you. Thanks. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Great. So I'm so sorry about that before. Um, so first, I want to briefly define uh, the APMs that we may be referring to in the Quality Payment Program. APMs generally refer to any alternative payment model that is based on uh, a specific health condition, a, a care episode, or um, a population of patients. MIPS APMs are a subset of APMs that meet additional standards of measuring cost and tying payment to quality performance. And advanced APMs meet even more standards uh, by requiring the use of certified EHR technology and um, having financial risk. Next slide. Now, when we talk about participants in APMs, we're um, referring specifically to eligible clinicians, their groups, and their APM entities. Um, So these, uh, these APM participants may or may not be QPs, and they may or may not be MIPS eligible. So it's important for all eligible clinicians to be aware of their status, uh, because not all participants in APMs or advanced APMs will necessarily be QPs. Um, and particularly in 2021, the QP threshold will be going up. And so many clinicians who were previously excluded from MIPS reporting requirements will now be subject to MIPS for the first time. Next slide. And next slide again, thank you. So in this year's rule, um, we have finalized some changes regarding MIPS eligible clinicians who are participants in MIPS APM. Um, and just to clarify, all uh, advanced APMs are also MIPS APM. So if you're in an advanced APM, I'm talking to you too. Uh, we have finalized our policy to sunset the APM scoring standard beginning with the 2021 performance year. We are finalizing um, a policy to allow APM entities to Submit to MIPS using any MIPS submission type or measure that are available to groups. So they're um, no longer going to be limited by the APM scoring standard. Um, and we hope that these two changes in particular will um, create more flexibility for APM participants in choosing how they want to participate in MIPS. Um, we also received a number of comments on uh, the, these two proposals, which pointed out that APM entities in MIPS APMs are already subject to cost containment measures. And in light of this, we are also um, going to be reweighting the cost performance categories for all APM entities, regardless of how they choose to participate in MIPS. Next slide. We also finalized the APM Performance Pathway, or the APP. Um, the APP is intended to be a streamlined MIPS reporting pathway, sort of akin to an MVP, but this is specifically for APM participants. It uh, includes a fixed group of measures that are intended to help reduce reporting burden. and um, uh, Something new about the APP uh, is that it is available to APM entities, but also for individuals or groups who want to, to report 
um, through the APP on their own. Um, again, providing more flexibility if the APM entity doesn't want to report or perhaps um, if the individual or group feels they can earn a higher score out on their own. Um, next slide. Um, so, again, similar to MVPs, the APP is a subset of measures and activities, and um, within it, we there are some scoring benefits. Um, for instance, the cost performance category is related to zero for anyone reporting via the APP, including individuals and groups. Um, the quality performance category is rated at 50% and is made up of six measures. Um, that will be um, three ECQMs, two claims measures, and the CAPS for MIP survey. And um, for the 2021 performance year only, uh, we will be expanding use of the CMS web interface to ACOs in order to um, allow them an opportunity to transition away from the web interface um, before um, requiring the use only of those three ECQMs. So, um, it, they will have the choice of the, of the CQMs or the web interface. Um, also of note, measures reported through the APP will be used for determining quality performance standards for shared savings program ACOs. But you'll hear more about that later. Um, the improvement activities performance category, which is weighted at 20%, uh, will be automatically assigned to anyone reporting through the APP and they will uh, receive a score of 100% just based on the requirements of participation in APM. And promoting interoperability will be reported and scored at the um, individual or group level as is required for the rest of MIPS. And um, I think we will hear more about that in this presentation as well. Next slide. And that is, uh, it for APM. Let me turn it back over to, sorry, I've lost who's following me. Hey, Brittany, oh. it's Sophia. Sophia, hey. sorry, I've done that to you. Sorry. It's, it's all right. Um, hi, everyone. This is Sophia Sigamore, and I'll take over from here. So if we can move to the next slide, please. All right, um, with regards to the MIPS eligibility requirements, we just wanted to flag for you all that there are no changes for 2021 in comparison to 2020. So we still have the same MIPS eligible clinician types, uh, the same low volume threshold criteria, determination period, and our uh, existing opt-in policy will continue on for 2021. So if you need additional information regarding that, you can refer to the QPP resource library for additional MIPS eligibility criteria information. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, for 2021, with regards to MIPS participation and reporting, uh, when you compare the table on the left versus the table on the right, you'll notice that we've added an APM entity as a submitter type. Uh, so APM entities may report to MIPS on behalf of associated MIPS eligible clinicians. The MIPS, the, sorry, the APM entity would be defined by the participation list or affiliated practitioner list of the applicable MIPS APM. Uh, clinicians in a MIPS APM will be evaluated for MIPS eligibility at the individual and group level. Uh, CMS will no longer evaluate entities for the low volume threshold. And that's uh, a bit different from what was done in 2020. Uh, furthermore, as uh, Brittany had previously mentioned, the APM scoring standard will not be used beginning with the 2021 performance period. Any APM entity that would want to report on quality and improvement activities, uh, performance categories can. We do note that the cost category would also be scored for APM entities. Uh, that do not report through the APP or the APM performance pathway. For promoting interoperability performance category, the APM entity would be calculated using a TIN or individual level PI score rolled up. Next, next slide, please. All right, uh, we'll get started here on a few of the updates regarding the performance category. So uh, if we can move to the next slide, I believe we'll start uh, with the 
performance category weight. Uh, so in this table here, you'll notice that we include our performance category weights for the four performance categories for the 2020 performance period. Uh, with regards to 2021 for MIPS specifically, uh, you'll notice that we have changes in the quality and cost performance category. And you'll notice that we've also included uh, right next to that the APM weight for the same performance categories for the 2021 performance year. Uh, so you will notice for MIPS, for individual groups and virtual groups, uh, that there is a decrease in quality to 40%, an increase in cost to, to 20%. And within the APM entities, you'll notice that quality equates to 50%, improvement activities to 20%, and PI is equated at 30%. We did include the 2022 performance categories, as you've noticed to the right of your screen. That is also to emphasize the message that Molly had mentioned earlier, that by 2022, we are required by statute to have quality and cost equate at 30% respectively. So each performance category is at 30%. Next slide, please. And we can go forward one more slide, please. Uh, within the next few slides, we'll get started on the updates for the quality performance category. Um, as previously mentioned uh, in our proposed rule, we did had initially proposed the sunsetting of the CMS web interface for the 2021 performance period. We have heard from uh, a lot of our stakeholders uh, who have had concerns about this, so we have decided to delay that sunsetting of the CMS web interface until the 2022 performance period. So the web interface will still be available for 2021, uh, with, along with the, all the other collection types that are mentioned in this slide, the ECQMs, Medicare Part B claims, MIPS CQMs, and QCDR measures. Uh, but we will, we are planning to and have finalized that the CMS web interface will sunset beginning with the 2022 performance period. Next slide, please. Okay, with regard to the MIPS quality measure inventory, we have made some changes and finalized those changes through this year's rule. So in total for the 2021 performance period, we will have 209 quality measures. Uh, so several of those measures are existing measures that have been in the MIPS program for this past year or possibly uh, earlier than that. And we did propose some changes, substantive changes to those measures through rulemaking. Uh, we do include the details of those specific measure changes in case you're curious within the appendix of the physician fee schedule final rule. Uh, I do refer you all there if you want to take a read of those specific changes. In addition to the individual measures, we have included changes to the given specialty sets. Not all specialty sets have been proposed with updates, but there are some that have been changed. Um, in addition to that, we have proposed the addition and removal of several individual measures. We did remove 11 quality measures from our program from 2020 to 2021. Uh, we have finalized also the inclusion of two uh, new measures in our program, both of which are administrative claims based, which re require no additional reporting burden on the uh, side of the clinician or group that is uh, choosing to report these measures. Next slide, please. With regards to the CMS uh, MIPS quality measure benchmarks and topped out measure policies, there are no changes with regards to the use of historical data to establish quality measure benchmarks. Um, we did initially propose in the proposal consideration to utilize performance period benchmarks, with, which would utilize uh, quote unquote live data uh, from the given performance period to create a benchmark, but we have heard uh, feedback regarding that and have decided that we will continue our process of utilizing historical benchmarks. Um, and with regards to the policy in which we would um, score topped out measures, there are no changes from what was previously finalized. So that, that seven year, I'm sorry, uh, that topped out measure life cycle policy in addition to the seven point cap that is associated with those topped out measures will continue on forward for the 2021 performance period. Next slide, please.
And I will turn it over now to Ronique Evans, who is our cost performance category lead. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Um, again, my name is Ronique Evans, and I'll be providing um, an overview of the 2021 QPP final rule for cost performance category. Um, so as you can see here, there have been very few changes. Um, there have been no changes to the existing measure set or changes to the attribution method. We did, however, for the 2021 final rule, make updates to measure set to include telehealth services where applicable. Um, and as just a reference, you can find these updated specifications um, on the macro feedback page. Next slide, please. And um, with that brief overview, I will pass it over to my colleagues in the Improvement Activities category. Thanks, Ronique. This is Michelle Peterman. I will be reviewing the final rule policies for the Improvement Activities Performance category, which were very minimal this year. Next slide, please. We made a few revisions to the inventory. We modified two existing IAs. Um, first, we modified one in the Beneficiary Engagement subcategory with the activity number of BE4, as titled Engagement of Patients Through Implementation of Improvements in Patient Portal. We added language to include caregivers as users of the patient portal instead of just patients and clinicians. And we clarified that portals um, should be used for bi-directional information exchange between patient and provider. And we also um, stated that the primary use should be clinical and not administrative. We also replaced the existing description with examples of a bi-directional portal functions that are clinical rather than administrative. Um, next, we modified one activity in the Achieving Health Equity subcategory. The activity number for that is AHE7, titled Comprehensive Eye Exam. For that one, we added language that spans services for underserved and high-risk populations, and we broadened the activity to promote vision rehab services. Um, we also adopted the COVID-19 IA that was added via the September 2nd interim final rule with comment. That one is in the emergency response and preparedness subcategory with the activity number of ERP3. The title for that one is COVID-19 clinical data reporting with or without a clinical trial. That one requires that in order to receive credit, the clinician must either participate in a COVID-19 clinical trial utilizing a drug or biological product to treat the patient with COVID-19 infection and report their findings through clinical data repository or clinical data registry, or they may participate in the care of patients diagnosed with COVID-19 and simultaneously submit that data to a clinical data registry. Um, and then lastly, we removed one obsolete improvement activity in the care coordination subcategory. That activity number is CC5, titled CMS Partner and Patient Hospital Engagement Network. Um, that one was removed because it's no longer available for clinicians to participate in. Next slide, please. Hi, this is so, Elizabeth um, Holland, and I'm going to be walking through oh, the Promoting Interoperability <laughs> Performance category. Next slide, please. So for promoting interoperability, we retain the query of prescription drug monitoring program measure as optional and increased its worth from five to 10 points to reflect the importance of co combating opioid, opioid abuse. We changed the name of one of the health information exchange measures and replace the word incorporate with reconcile to better reflect what's required in the measure. And we added a new optional health information exchange measure called the HIE bidirectional exchange measure. This is an optional alternative to the two existing measures. Um, it will be reported through a yes, no attestation and is worth 40 points. Um, next slide, please. We also made updates to certified EHR technology due to the 21st Century Cures Act, providing flexibility for healthcare providers to use the current 2015 edition of CERT or to use the updated version, um, the Cures updated version until December 31st, 2022. After that date, 
all providers must be using the 2015 edition Cures update edition version. And I will note that this change um, is for MIPS eligible clinicians, but it also is for other healthcare providers such as eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals. Next slide, please. So finally, we decided to retain the reweighting policies for the non-physician clinician types listed on this slide. And next slide, I will be turning it over to Sophia again to discuss third-party intermediaries. Thanks, Elizabeth. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, with regards to the finalization of policies for third-party intermediaries, uh, we will start with the data submission-related updates. Um, and, and this is to really flag that uh, QCDRs are what we call qualified clinical data registries, qualified registries and health IT vendors, um, should be able to submit data for all three performance categories that require uh, data submission. That would be quality, improvement activities, and the promoting interoperability performance category. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, one being that for quality, uh, if you're not a CAPS for, CAPS for MIPS survey vendor, uh, you would not be able to submit that measure. And the other exception being that um, only QCDRs can submit QCDR measures, so qualified registries and health IT vendors are exempt from that or are not uh, required to do that. Um, the other caveat we want to mention is related to promoting interoperability. There is a requirement that QCDRs and qualified registries and health IT vendors who wish to support MVPs um, be able to support, support the promoting interoperability performance category. However, if a third party intermediary uh, supports a clinician type that is exempt from the promoting interoperability performance category, uh, we, uh, the third party intermediary is not required to support that performance category. And uh, in addition to that, uh, one thing we want to flag that is new is with the finalization of the MVP framework, QCDRs and qualified registries and health IT vendors will be able to support the reporting of MIPS value pathways or MVPs uh, beginning with the 2022 performance period. Uh, health, we wanted to note that health IT vendors that choose not to support MVPs will be required to submit data out for at least one of the performance categories listed above, um, and uh, that it would be quality improvement activities or the promoting interoperability, interoperability performance category. Um, in addition, for the 2021 performance period, uh, these third-party intermediaries can support the APM performance pathway. And uh, as I mentioned before, those MVPs will start to be available beginning with the 2022 performance period, and uh, it's through the self-nomination period in which uh, health IT vendors such as the QCDR or registry may be able to select which MVPs they choose to report on. Next slide, please. And apologies for the background noise. I know we're trying to get that corrected. Um, it's not. I know it's not me. <laughs> um, moving on to the next slide here on data validation to continue onward. Uh, this requirement is specifically for QCDRs and qualified registries, and this is an existing requirement that we wanted to provide a bit more clarity on. I'm sorry. Is there a way we can uh, kind of get rid of that background noise, please? It's hard to tell if people can hear me. Um, with regards to the data validation audit requirements, we did not make any uh, drastic updates to these. This is the updates we made were more to clarify our um, our desire to have more uh, clear data validation requirements for our QCDRs and registries uh, who have been participating in the program and those organizations that are interested in becoming QCDRs and registries in the future, what is expected of you as a QCDR or registry uh, when you choose to submit data on behalf of clinicians and groups. So they are listed here um, that data validation must occur prior to the a submission of that data to CMS for purposes of the MIPS program. All data that is intended to be submitted to CMS for purposes of the MIPS program should be uh, 
eligible for validation, so that could be data across all the performance categories, quality, improvement activities, and promoting interoperability. Also that um, data validation should occur across all, cl occur across all clinician types um, that are participating in through that a given QCDR registry for purposes of the MIPS program. So that could include uh, MIPS individual eligible clinicians, groups, virtual groups, voluntary participants, and opt-in participants. Ultimately, uh, it's a third-party intermediary that needs to certify that the data they submit to us is true, accurate, or complete, true, accurate, and complete. Therefore, uh, we would expect that they would be able to conduct this validation and identify, if they identify any errors, correct those errors prior to submitting that data to CMS. Next slide, please. A few other areas of policy which we've uh, finalized through the 2021 rule related to third-party intermediaries, one of which is related to our remedial action and termination policies. We do have a process in place in which, where we place, uh, if vendors are found to be non-compliant uh, with a given program requirement or uh, they have uh, identified or discovered large amounts of data errors that have significantly negatively impacted clinicians, uh, we do have the ability to either place a vendor on remedial action or terminate them. And so as a part of the remedial action process, we do require that uh, third-party intermediary submit to us a corrective action plan. And so these, um, these, men these bullet points listed here is to really have um, QCDRs, registries, and other uh, third-party intermediaries understand what is expected of them when they submit a corrective action plan. So they need to identify the issue, kind of outline the impact of the volume of clinicians that were impacted, um, what steps were taken to actually resolve the issue or to ensure it won't occur again in the future, and a timeline of how they intend to resolve the issue at hand. Um, we do not want uh, there to be instances where issues come up that thereby negatively impact clinicians and uh, the downstream and we don't want the clinicians feeling the downstream impacts of those issues. Another area of policy that we've uh, finalized is related to approval criteria specific for third parties, and this is to really um, ensure that the uh, third party intermediaries that we have in the program are of uh, the best quality and also high integrity and uh, will continue to support the program and the clinicians who choose to utilize them to report to our program in a manner that's not burdensome. And so for that reason, we have finalized criteria that would consider um, a third-party intermediary who, if they participate in the MIPS program, their past performance as a third-party intermediary. So uh, any discrepancies with uh, or noncompliance in the past, if, if there has been any history of that, that could impact whether or not they would be available as a third-party intermediary in the MIPS program uh, moving forward. In addition to that, we do we will consider any history of issues that have come up with the sharing of inaccurate information to clinicians regarding the quality payment program and our requirements. Uh, this may also, examples of this may uh, also be when we have third party intermediaries who um, promote the cherry picking of data to uh, qualify clinicians for possibly the best score versus really um, pushing forward our goals and vision of quality improvement and uh, the basis of our program, which is to ensure that clinicians continuous to make, continuously make uh, you know, quality improvement initiatives in their care actions. Um, all third parties also are required to uh, attend and complete trainings and support sessions in a form and manner um, uh, specified by CMS. And really, uh, the type of training or support call um, or meeting attendance requirements are dependent on the health IT or sorry the third party intermediary vendor type, um, and so we'll, we will ask those organizations interested in becoming a third party intermediary, regardless of the type, to kind of defer to those specific requirements um, based on the vendor type you are choosing to uh, become. Next slide, please. These last requirements are related to specifically the QCDRs and the Qualified Clinical Data Registries. Uh, these are specifically related to the QCR measure requirements. 
In the 2020 rule, we did finalize that all QCDR measures must be fully tested at the, uh, by the time they are self-nominated for 2021. However, in light of the um, pandemic, the public health emergency, we did um, issue an IFC or interim final rule with comment period in which we've delayed the QCDR measure testing requirement until the 2020 performance year, sorry, performance period. We also uh, delayed the QCDR me measure data collection requirement until 20, the 2022 year. Um, and this is really to acknowledge that we understand there may be a uh, lack of data collection to help support these requirements, especially with measure testing and the need for data collection there. Uh, we decided to hold off and wait till 2022 to enact these uh, requirements. Uh, something that's changed through the 2021 rule related specifically to measure testing is um, for measures that are uh, being considered for the tradi traditional MIPS program, uh, we are we finalizing that two-step um, QCR measure testing process to then not require full testing uh, from the get-go for 2021, but to require um, a gradual two-step process with testing beginning with the 2022 performance period. So in the first year of a measure being self-nominated and started with 2022, uh, the, the only part of the requirement that would need to be met is the face validity testing. Uh, any year after that in which the measure would be considered for inclusion, the measure must be fully tested. So in that first year of the measure's life, uh, we would only require face validity testing. Any year after that, we would need the measure to be fully tested. Um, and one other thing to flag here is related to the inclusion of QCDR measures within MIPS value pathways. We have finalized that QCDR measures can be included in MIPS value pathways. However, for that to be considered, uh, the QCDR measure must be fully tested at the clinician level. And I'm, next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Molly McCarris for the COVID-19 flexibility. Okay, thanks, Sophia. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. Okay, let me get out of the Q&A. All righty. Um, so just a few other updates we uh, wanted to provide for our, some flexibilities that we've offered as well as our performance thresholds. So um, as folks will recall, we have had a complex patient bonus within the MIPS program for many years. Typically, it's available for up to five final score points that is based off of a calculation of clinicians, uh, dual eligible patients, and their HCC risk score. For this performance year only, and I mean this as in the year we're currently in, so calendar year 2020, if any clinicians, groups, uh, et cetera, are not filing a COVID-19 hardship for all of their performance categories, and if they are still choosing to participate, in the program for this year, as long as we receive data on at least one measure or activity uh, for any of the performance categories, we will attempt to calculate this complex patient bonus, and we've doubled the number of available points from up to five to up to 10. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, and then some, some additional 2020 changes we made for our extreme and uncontrollable uh, circumstances application. So no changes were made for how it applies for individuals, groups, or virtual groups, but beginning with the 2020 performance period, and we've already touched on this earlier on, but just to restate it, APM entities can submit an application to request reweighting of all of the performance categories. If the application is approved, the APM entity will receive a score equal to the performance threshold, even if data is submitted. And this would apply to all clinicians in the APM entity. And so please note that that is different than our approach for everyone else. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And then the next slide again. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, earlier on within the presentation, we again retained our previously finalized performance threshold of 60 points for this upcoming year, calendar year 2021. Uh, we also did not make any changes to our extra uh, performance threshold, which is at 85 points. Um, I do wanna note that we only have two more years left of this additional performance threshold that is available, uh, calendar year 2021 and 2022. Let's move on to the next slide.
Okay, and our table of the payment adjustment distribution. So um, as you can see here, and I'll focus on the right-hand side of the table, um, going from the performance threshold up, so for clinicians whose final score is at or above 60 points, that's where they would be able to earn a positive payment adjustment. And again, if it is above 85 points, they would be able to earn any monies available for the extra performance threshold. For anyone whose final score is below 60 points for this upcoming year, uh, they would get a negative payment adjustment. And anyone whose final score is below the maximum uh, negative adjustment of uh, the lowest quartile, so anyone who scores below 15 points would automatically get the maximum negative adjustment of negative 9%. Um, so wanted to flag this up front so folks are tracking to this. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation and also within the Q&A today, uh, I do want to flag for folks' awareness that 2021 is our last year that we have available our special rule where the Secretary has further flexibility on where we set the performance threshold. Beginning in calendar year 2022, we must set the performance threshold based off of a prior year's mean or median, and we currently are estimating that to be approximately 74 points. So do want folks to be aware of that up front um, so they can target that for their reporting. Okay, and I think there's one more slide for me, if we can move to that. And so then the last item I wanted to touch on is we did make some revisions to which final score we would use in the event that a given clinician has more than one final score. So previously, up until now, in the event that someone has more than one final score, so for example, if there's reporting on their behalf as part of an APM entity and then also as an individual. The hierarchy we used to have is we would always take the APM entity score first, then the virtual group score, and then whatever was highest. Instead, what we've done uh, as a way to simplify the program is we would take the virtual group final score first, and that is required by law. And then from there, we would use the highest available final score uh, based off of uh, whichever way that the clinician participates. And let's move on to the next slide. And I believe from here, I'm turning it over to Brittany to talk through advanced APM. Brittany? Thanks, Molly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a quick recap, an advanced APM is an APM that meets the following three criteria. It requires the use of certified EHR technology. It includes the use of a MIPS comparable quality measure, including an outcome measure that is tied to payment. And it uh, requires its participants to, to take on more than nominal financial risk. Um, participants in advanced APMs are eligible to earn QP or qualifying APM participant status uh, if they engage in sufficient level of participation in one or more advanced APMs. Um, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, in 2021, the statutorily defined threshold will be increasing to 75% of claims or 50% of patients that must be seen through an advanced APM. Um, so just I saw some questions asking about that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for 2021, we finalized the policy to tweak our methodology for calculating whether an advanced APM participant crosses that QP threshold. In situations where a Medicare beneficiary meets the requirements to be considered attribution eligible or included in the denominator for more than one APM entity, but the APM attribution rules preclude the beneficiary from actually being attributed or put in the, in the numerator uh, for more than one APM entity, uh, the clinicians may find themselves disadvantaged through no fault of their own. So beginning with the 2021 performance year, in scenarios like what I just described, we will remove from the attribution eligible population or the denominator, any beneficiaries who are precluded by the rules of the APM from actually being attributed to the APM entity. Uh, we also finalized a policy 
to allow targeted review of QP determinations in situations where an eligible clinician or APM entity where uh, uh, they believe in good faith that CMS has made a clerical error in inadvertently omitting an eligible clinician from the APM entity's participation list on, more, on one or more snapshot dates. Uh, next slide. I think that's it for me. Yes, and I will hand it over to Fiona to talk about uh, the Medicare Shared Savings Program rules. Thank you, Brittany. Um, as Brittany said, I'm going to go over the Medicare Shared Savings Program final policies. Next slide, please. So for performance year 2020, all ACOs are considered to be affected by the public health emergency for the COVID-19 pandemic, and the Shared Savings Program Extreme and Uncontrollable Circumstances policy applies. In addition, we finalize our proposal to waive the requirements for ACOs to field a CAPS for ACO survey and provide automatic full credit, and we will be providing automatic full credit for the patient experience of care measures. Next slide, please. Additionally, we finalized with modifications the proposed revisions to the Shared Savings Program quality reporting requirements. For performance year 2021, ACOs will be required to report via the APM Performance Pathway, or APP. They may choose to report either the 10 web interface measures or three ECQM measures via the APP. They must field a CAPS or MIPS survey, and CMS will calculate two claims-based measures. Based on an ACO's chosen collection type, either six or 10 measures will be included in the calculation of the ACO's quality performance score. I would note if the ACO chooses to report via the CMS web interface, only seven of the 10 measures will be scored as three measures have no benchmarks, but all 10 measures must be reported. For performance year 2022 and subsequent performance years, the CMS web interface will no longer be an available collection type. ACOs will be required to actively report quality data on the three ECQM MIP CQM measures via the APP, field the CAPS or MIP survey, and CMS will calculate two measures using administrative claims data. Under this approach, ACOs would only need to report one set of quality metrics that would meet requirements for both MIPS and the Shared Savings Program. Next slide, please. We also finalized a modified version of our original proposal to increase the quality performance standard. The quality performance standard is the minimum performance level ACOs must achieve in order to share in any savings earned, avoid maximum losses under certain payment tracks, and avoid quality-related compliance actions. Specifically, we finalized the following gradual phase-in. An ACO would meet the Shared Savings Program quality performance standard if for so performance years 2021 and 2022, the ACO achieves a quality performance score that is equivalent to or higher than the 30th percentile across all MIPS quality performance category scores. And for performance year 2023 and subsequent performance years, the ACO achieves a quality performance score that is equivalent to or higher than the 40th percentile across all MIPS quality performance category scores. Under this new policy, if the quality performance standard is met and an ACO shared in savings, the ACO would receive the maximum sharing rate. Conversely, if an ACO in track two or the enhanced track met the quality performance standard and owed losses, losses would be scaled using the MIPS quality performance category score. If an ACO in basic track C through E met the quality performance standard and owed losses, CMS would apply a fixed percentage loss sharing rate. In conjunction with our changes to the quality performance standard, we also finalized policies strengthening our shared savings program requirements regarding compliance with the quality performance standard by broadening the condition under which CMS may terminate an ACO's participation agreement when an ACO demonstrates a pattern of failure to meet the quality performance standard. That's um, the end of the um, shared savings program policies, and I'll hand it back to Casey. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Fiona. All right, we are almost done, so we can get to that QA. Um, don't worry, folks. Um, we are going to have all the slides, transcripts, and recording of today's presentation available soon um, 
like a week or so after the presentation um, on our uh, webinar library. So don't don't worry about missing anything. I know we uh, threw a lot at you today. We also currently have available on our resource library um, the materials you see on the screen. So we have a fact sheet with comparison table that lays out all the policies we discussed today, as well as um, a detailed FAQ document and our MVP uh, submission template. So I encourage everybody to, to go check out those resources. Next slide. And lastly, um, I'm sure a lot of folks have, have already used these services, but just like to remind folks that they are available. So we do have uh, no-cost technical assistance available for small um, underserved and rural support is, is available for clinicians that need it. This is really great one-on-one um, -on -one support, so we encourage you to check that out if it applies to, um, to you. We also always have our QPP uh, website available with a lot of the resources we went through today, as well as our agents ready and waiting at the QPP Service Center to answer any questions. And then we also have our uh, CMMI uh, learning systems available. All right, so with that, I'm not going to hold us up anymore. Um, let's, let's go ahead and jump into QA. So I'm going to turn it back over to our team on the phone to tell us how to do that. Thanks. We will now begin the question and answer portion of the webinar. You can ask questions via the chat or the phone. To ask a question via the phone, please dial 1-833-376-0535. If prompted, please provide ID 129-5435. Press star 1 to be added to the question queue. Please note that we may not be able to answer all questions submitted via the Q&A box. If your question is not answered, please contact the Quality Payment Program Service Center at qpp at cms.hhs.gov. Please hold Great. for your first question. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, thank you, Katie. All right. The first question um, that we've received asks, what is the difference between MIPS and MIPS value pathways? Hi, Lauren. Sure. This is Molly. I can address that. So MIPS is our, um, so thinking back to the quality payment program, we have our two tracks for participation in the quality payment program, which includes MIPS and our advanced alternative payment model. Within the MIPS program, we are looking to introduce a new way that people can participate, which we've called MIPS Value Pathways, which essentially is a subset of measures and activities. So you can think of MVPs as a new participation method within the MIPS program. Um, and I also want to flag for folks' awareness, we do intend to uh, start implementing MVPs, again, beginning in the 2022 year. And we do anticipate that there will be a transition period uh, from when or as we work to build out our MVPs available for clinicians and as we then look to sunset or end our traditional MIPS program. Um, but we do anticipate that that will take some time. Thanks, Lauren. Great. Thanks, Molly. Okay, your next question asks, is the low volume threshold for MIPS the same for APM? Could you repeat that? Is the low volume threshold? Yep, is the threshold for MIPS the same for APM? There is no low volume threshold for APM, so yes. <laughs> All MIPS eligible clinicians have the same low volume threshold, including those who participate in APM. Great, thank you. Um, okay, next, what is the difference between an MVP and its value pathway and the APP, and how does it benefit to enroll in an MVP versus an APP? This is Brittany. I can take that. Um, so the APP is a performance pathway that is specifically for APM participants, and um, there isn't when MVPs become available, there won't necessarily be um, an advantage to one over the other. It just depends on um, how you choose to participate and what your practice looks like in terms of specialties and which measure set makes the most sense to you. Um, with the little asterisk that if you are in an MSSP ACO, you are required to report the APP. 
Great, thank you. Um, okay, and off the back of that, to clarify, MVPs are postponed until 2022, but can you confirm that the APP will be in place for the 2021 performance year? Yes, that's correct. The, a the APM performance pathway will be available starting with the 2021 performance period. The MVPs will only start to be available beginning with the 2022 performance period. Great. Um, Stephanie, do we have any questions on the phone line? Your first question comes from the line of Jason Sharpshire. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, they can hear you. Can you hear me? It's just a couple quick questions. So the first, can you clarify, so if you're an advanced APM and you're reporting to APP set, do you have to report any promoting interoperability measures or do you not have to report those? I don't know if we, can, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. That's the, I'm sorry. The question was, if you participate in an advanced APM, do you have to report PI? Is that the question? Correct. As part of the APP set. Gotcha. Right. So, oh, go ahead, Brittany. Oh, sorry, Damon. Um, the question isn't really so much whether you're in an advanced APM as whether you are a QP. If you've gotten QP status, you are exempted from MIP, and you don't need to report anything um, beyond the quality measures that are required by SSP. If you are in an advanced track of SSP, but you don't get QP status, uh, you will be, well, you need to report PI for MIP scoring purposes. Um, so be on the safe side, anyone who um, could be MIPS eligible should be prepared to report PI unless and until they achieve QP status. Okay, thank you. And then really quickly, can you advise when we begin to receive information about reporting web interface for this calendar year 2020? Normally we have like webinars, lots of resources by now, but I've seen nothing so far from CMS. Hi, this is Katie Moore. I'm going to jump in on that one. Um, very soon. <clears throat> We're just putting, um, just with the change um, from our proposed policy to our final policy where we're keeping web interface, um, just taking us a little bit longer to get um, everything together, but we will have the dates and all of that available really soon. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, okay, so your next question um, from the chat box asks, if we took a hardship test last year for promoting interoperability, can we take the same hardship again this year? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, next question asks, um, under what circumstances would an APM entity report traditional MIPS? In other words, I understand that an ACO will be reporting the APP. Um, however, under what circumstances would that ACO report traditional MIPS? Right. I, I saw this question come up a number of times. So um, there's a couple of situations that I can think of. I'm sure there are more out there. Um, but uh, Specifically, I'm thinking of, of cases where an ACO might think um, that they can get a higher score on measures other than the ones in the APP. Um, you might have an ACO that maybe is very specialist heavy and they, they really want to um, have their measures like reported based on their specialty. Um, perhaps they're also concerned about what's being shown in Physician Compare. Um, and the, the other thing I can think of is if the ACO is uh, also involved in um, another APM, such as like an oncology care model, um, you know, down the road, particularly as MVPs come online, um, something, some other quality measures that might make more sense for them in terms of MIPS scoring and uh, physician compare reporting. Great, thank you. Okay, Stephanie, do we have any more questions on the phone line? Our next question comes from Mary Arrowwood. Hi, 
Hi, um, this is Mary Arrowood, Augusta Care Partners. We're an MSSP ACO, um, and we are a MIPS APM. Um, we'll continue to be one through 2021, um, and we're trying at this point to better understand advantages, disadvantages of reporting through the APP versus the CMS web interface for 2021. And so my question is, we're a multi-specialty ACO with over 20 EMRs um, in our network. Would we be expected via the APP to be reporting those ECQMs out of each of those EMRs? Fiona, do you want me to take this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, the web interface is actually considered um, – I'm uh, – a measure set or like an alternative measure set within the APP. So you still satisfy that um, requirement of reporting the APP even if you submit the web interface. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to answer your question, you would not be re we would not ask you to submit each EHR uh, file separately. Um, we would ask you to submit the aggregated data um, for the, the three CQMs. Right. So I guess a follow-up question to that, whenever you're talking data aggregation, there's cost associated with that. So to clarify, we would still be required to report the data from those EMRs, but just aggregate it into a, a health IT vendor platform, because that would be super expensive for our independent practice participants. Uh, I do understand that this would mean a shift in a, the reporting platform. Um, I probably would have to defer to Fiona at this point, um, getting more into the specifics of uh, the makeup of ACOs. Um, but that that is feedback that we received quite a bit of in the proposed rule and was part of uh, the decision um, to continue to allow the use of the web interface for an additional year. Um, to try to give folks more time to um, work out how best to address this change in measure requirements. Um, yeah, thank you, Brittany. So as, as Brittany said, we did um, choose to um, keep the web interface for that one additional year to be able to give um, ACOs time to be able to set their systems up to be able to report these ECQMs or CQMs um, from 2022 onwards. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I, I guess I just um, am still trying to understand the, the operational impact of that on all of our practices. Um, because just to clarify, 2021 is the last year for the web interface. So we would have to somehow figure out how to get all of these independent practices aggregated and ready to roll for 2022, correct? Yes, yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. It's unfortunate, but thank you. Okay, great. Um, so moving back to chat questions, um, we just received a question that says, um, can you please clarify what the 2021 QP threshold is? Yes, in 2021, the um, uh, payment amount threshold will be 75%, and the patient count threshold will be 50%. Great, thank you. Um, okay, another question on the MVPs. Will the MVPs ultimately replace reporting through MIPS um, through the four distinct performance categories, or is it intended to be an alternative pathway only? Uh, yeah, hi, Lauren. It's Molly again. So similar to the last question I answered on this, it would be an alternative option within our MIPS uh, program that we currently have available. So you guys may um, have heard us uh, use the phrase traditional MIPS. That's what we're using um, internally, and you're starting to hear some of those terms outside on how we're designating the 
uh, program that you all currently know as MIPS, and then the future state of MVPs. Um, but again, we do anticipate that both would be available for the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and Stephanie, do we have another question left on the phone line? We do have a question from Lena Nanda. Um, hi, uh, I, uh, we are a, an ACO, um, primarily of PCPs. We're independent uh, practices as well as a, a large medical group. Um, I didn't see this addressed in your, um, in your slides, but I was under the impression for those of us that are submitting under the MSSP QPP in, for the 2020 performance year, do we, like my understanding is that um, for our shared savings and for all the other calculations, the MIPS um, that we're doing, that we would have the option of either applying our 2019 quality um, score or our 2020 quality score. Can you confirm that? I haven't seen the the final rules and regs. I'm not sure where they are. Um, so this is Fiona. So for performance year 2020, our, our um, extreme and uncontrollable circumstance policy is that if an ACO um, does not report quality, they will receive the 2020 mean. And if an ACO does report quality, they will either get the higher of the 2020 score or the 2020 mean. I'm sorry. Great. I thought the. I'm sorry. I, I want to just follow up here. I was under the impression from the rules that if we do submit, we we get the higher of either the 2019 score or the 2020 score. No, that was just a common solicitation in the rule, um, and we did not. Um, that was just a comment solicitation, and we actually have our existing policy in place. We did not make any changes to our existing policy, which would be that either the you would either get the 2020 mean if you don't report, or you would get the higher of your own score or the 2020 mean. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, I would note that you also get full credit for the um, caps um, measures because the requirements of those have been waived as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Fiona. Um, okay, well, that's actually all the time that we have for questions for today. So I will pass it back to Katie Moore from CMS to go ahead and conclude the webinar. Great. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks, everybody, for taking uh, the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, again, just a reminder to sign up for our QPP listeners if you haven't already. Um, you can subscribe at the bottom of qpp.cms.gov. And we will have the resources from uh, today's event available on our webinar library soon. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect.